framework of Marmara Urban Forum. Uh, we're going to now have a very entertaining um, session. Me and Cem Gökpınar will be moderating uh, this session. I'm an art um, historian, and I have very esteemed guests with me. I'm not uh, doing moderation uh, very frequently, and I have very esteemed colleagues, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm sure it's going to be a great session altogether. And, of course, they don't need any luck uh, for the session to be a great one. So here, of course, um, we will, uh, I mean, the 18th um, Venice um, Architecture Biennial was uh, established. And we're going to uh, talk about a certain theory in architecture. Um, uh, and we have the founders of uh, uh, an architecture fir firm, a very esteemed architecture firm with us. Um, okay, so we've been following you for a very long time. We know your projects very well, but of course, uh, the exhibition uh, critership you have done during the biennial in the Turkish pavilion uh, was very um, important. I mean, I'm sure everyone followed the exhibition, but maybe you can talk about the theme of the exhibition first of all to introduce it, and then we will continue with our questions. Thank you very much for your invitation and for this very lovely introduction. Uh, well, with Oral, we have established soil architecture um, in 2017, and since then, we've been uh, researching um, uh, many projects regarding urbanization. And of course, things happened based on a coincidence. We graduated from Istanbul Technical University in 2005, and when we wanted to do something based on research, if there had never been a researcher on that topic, you can do it. But I remember um, there was an international urbanization forum that was held in Istanbul, and there was a workshop that was initiated by that panel. And we were a very young um, office back then, and there were five young officers like us, and there we were going to execute research about Istanbul. That was a big opportunity for us, and it continued. And in the next 15 years, to hold an exhibition in the Venice Biennial uh, of the Turkish Pavilion, of course, is a very impressive thing. It was something we were looking for for long years. And with Arda, uh, I remember in two since 2006, Ika Saives started um, choosing offices, and we've been applying since 2006. And in 2022 application, we won. And of course, a completely different uh, process started in our lives. I mean, we never thought that this would be such a huge thing. I mean, it was, uh, of course, a, a, was very important. It was a big magnitude for us to be able to express something about Turkey and to do it in a globally in a global platform. So that was amazing. But we, of course, didn't want to do. We, of course, we didn't want to say something like, this is how we have messed up with the cities. This is how we distract the, the cities. Um, and so it, we didn't want to also turn it into a book. Um, but when Esan Karel also included in the process, she said this definitely has to be a book. Um, and she really pushed us to be a book. I mean, I had a book before uh, that was published about the Bayezid Square. And it took me 10 years. So I thought, we can never come up with a book in six months. And I always, you know, I said, no, we cannot do it. It's not possible, etc. And then by in the meantime, there was the earthquake in Turkey. So that was the process. Well, what a great summary. Uh, yeah, I did not stop talking, so I wanted to stop at this point. So there was a presentation about your exhibition. Should we show it now or later? Well, we're going to talk about the book a little bit today. Um, but the book is actually a part of the exhibition that was presented in Venice 
Um, so let's see, first of all, the exhibition in Venice, because like in the movie, everything is summarized in two and a half minutes. So here you go. Evet, buyurun. Mimarın çuval teorisi sergisi mevcut yapıları dönüştürmeye odaklanıyor. İnşaat mekansal ihtiyaçlar için değil, ekonomik döngülerin sürekliliği için yapıldığında dünyanın pek çok kentinde benzer bir tablo karşımıza çıkıyor. Kullanılmayan ya da çok kısa süre kullanıldıktan sonra altın kalan yapılar. Biz bu sergide bu yapıların Türkiye'deki örneklerine odaklanıyoruz. Aslında şu anlamda özel bir noktada hem bu yapılardan çok fazla var hem de çok farklı tipolojilerde bulunmakta. Havaalanından tema parkına, okul projelerinden hastane projelerine çok geniş bir elbazede ciddi bir kullanılmayan yapı stoğumuz bulunmakta. Biz bu tartışmayı hem yayabilmek hem de daha geniş bir şekilde toplayabilmek için bir açık çağrıda bulunduk. Ve bu açık çağrıya gelen video fotoğraflar ile serginin bulut kısmını aslında oluşturduk. Sergi sadece bu buluttan ibaret değil. Aynı zamanda tezgah kısmında da bütün bu yapıların nasıl dönüşebileceğine dair elimizdeki enstrümanların neler olduğunu, nasıl mimarların bu yapıları dönüştürmek adına tepki verdiğini ve tasarımlar yaptığına bakıyoruz. Bir üçüncü noktada da test sürüşü videosu var. Bu videoda da yapay zekayı kullanarak bu mevcut açık çağrıdan gelen fotoğrafların nasıl dönüştürülebileceğine dair bir deneme aslında yapıyoruz. Yapay zekanın bizim gibi bir güzel çirkin ön yargısı olmaması özellikle bu noktada çok önemli. Çok büyük müdahalelerde bulunmadan daha küçük dokunuşlarla bu binaların nasıl dönüşebileceğine dair aslında bir deneme videosu bu. Sergenin özellikle 15 maddeden oluşan tezgah kısmının kurgusunu bir manifesto oluşturuyor. O manifestomuz da mimarının çuval teorisinin omurgası aslında. Mimarının çuval teorisi Fischer'ın ve Ursula Le Guin'in çuval teorileri mimarlığa uyarlanmış hali. Bu çuval teorileri özgün halinde bireysel kahramanlık hikayeleri yerine ortaklaşa sürdürülen yaşam hikayelerine odaklanıyor. Biz bunu mimarlığa uyarladığımızda yapıyı bir sanat eseri ve mimarlığı bireysel bir iş olarak görmek yerine ortaklaşa çabalarla bir yaşam hikayesi mimarlığın odağında olabilir mi diye sorduk. Ve bu sergi özelinde de kahraman yapıların başarı hikayelerini dinlemektense terk edilmiş yapıların hikayelerini dinleyerek buradan umut dolu bir sergi çıkarabilir miyiz diye düşündük. Uh, they didn't expect anything like that first when they saw in the photos. I mean, I'm not trying to brag about what we've done, but even in the video, you cannot see how amazing it was because the Turkish pavilion was 500 square meters, but it's like a thin square and it's one of the oldest uh, buildings uh, there. So even if you don't do anything, even if it's an empty space, you get impressed um, immensely. And then the projections and then the shadows, you know, reflected through the projections. So the atmosphere is really not very easy to describe. It was um, very extraordinary. But uh, there were two theories there. 
On the cloud side, we made an open call and we collected the abandoned buildings stories in Turkey because this is not only related to the architects or it's not only about urban planners or urban experts. Everyone can be a part of this. Everyone can actually think about these abandoned buildings. And when we made an open call, um, there was a lot of attention. There were a lot of applications and we were actually Um, publishing examples from that, but we didn't want to depict a dark uh, atmosphere. We didn't want to say like construction is an addiction in Turkey and we have constructed so many buildings and it is what the economy is based on, etc. We didn't want to depict such a dark uh, dark um, picture. So that is why uh, the manifesto, that is actually the spine of the book, And uh, with all those 15 desks coming together, and by the way, Biennial's uh, main theme was the f- laboratory of the future. So we wanted to see it like a lab of the future and how we can actually benefit the urban spaces based on this. And this is why we have it in the manifesto in the book. So this video and the things you just said uh, were actually an answer to my first question. But still, I would like to, I mean, this was like an introduction, the summary, the brief. Um, can we also talk about the details as well? Because this theme you were uh, talking about, Lesi Loco's um, a theme being announced like the future lab, the laboratory of the future. So what were the first um, um, associations you've made with it? Well, when there was an open call, I mean, you know what the theme is about. And then you know uh, how the curator relates to that topic. It doesn't have to be very direct. It doesn't have to be related um, one-to-one, like uh, directly. But Leslie Loco's theme of uh, laboratory of the future is a very wide topic, but in fact, Uh, he, he claims that it's Africa. So within the parenthesis, there is this limited definition. The future lab is Africa. So we were kind of a little bit uh, restricted in that area. It was too specific. And they wanted to actually discuss this very specific topic. And for some countries, it's easier to actually contribute to that. For instance, if they have exploited any African country before, it's easier. But to really draw a direct link between Africa and Turkey, especially from the perspective of architecture, uh, was very challenging. But we really thought a lot about this concept of uh, um, laboratory of the future. This was something actually we were working on in the office, and most of the projects we have established was about the transformation of the current buildings. And when we say current buildings, they were not licensed buildings, because licensed buildings are already buildings that need to be protected, that need to be transformed within certain Uh, framework of rules. But for us, there were actually projects that we could demolish and rebuild again. Most of them were like that, but we did not prefer to do so. And this is how, this is what you're going to read in the book, uh, the concept of a pool. Because the SAC theory of architecture, I mean, this actually started with an Instagram post uh, seven years ago. Sevin J wrote this uh, with Ursula and Elizabeth. So we said this laboratory of the future is actually are these buildings. And there's so many in Turkey, so many different typologies, so many different forms of them. And so this is how we're going to relate to the theme. And that's what we did. Thank you very much. And let's talk about the SAC theory, because when you say SAC theory, it's more about the stories of the people. And with you, uh, we're also focusing on the stories of architecture. Uh, So you say ghost stories. Ghost stories, the sectary in architecture, together with the open um, call. What was the photograph or the building blocks and your expectations about these building blocks at first? And what happened at, at the end? I mean, you started with the sectary. You went, I mean, this process 
towards the open call. What happened there? Well, uh, uh, there was a pool project we did with in Florida. That was exactly one year before the biennial started. And we were going to publish it on our Instagram account. And we're going to, I mean, there is a pool instead of demolishing that pool because we don't want to demolish anything. I mean, but by the way, it didn't have any historic value. But instead of demolishing it, I mean, let's maybe show it in the video. That would definitely mean uh, more. You will understand better. Can we please switch to the PDF? OK, so this is the pool. So instead of demolishing this pool, we uh, recommended that it's transformed. And if a, uh, IPA, uh, Istanbul Planning Agency, accepted this offer because um, instead of to transforming this into an event place, they always think that it's cheaper to demolish it and then rebuild something else. But uh, you're not seeing it on this picture, but there's a structure on top of it that may allow the pool to be used both in the summer and winter. So this is uh, the story of this campus. Before 2019, in fact, in during the early Republican time, it was an urban forest. But then the bureaucrats have used it as a private um, area for their own uh, guests. And this is the pool for the guests. Uh, and then in 2014, and uh, this um, was given uh, to, uh, was open to public access again by the municipality. And it was turned into the campus of Istanbul Planning Agency. And they didn't know what to do with the swimming pool. So we turned the swimming pool into an event space. <coughs> Here, you see it on the left hand side, right hand side as well. So when you look at this place, um, it doesn't have the um, aesthetics that we're used to normally. In fact, one of the architects uh, the, who have seen that the experienced the architects said, let's, you know, um, uh, maybe paint them to black. And also you see the ceramics of the swimming pool. We wouldn't normally choose it, but we said, let's keep it. Let's keep the swimming pool's structure as it's so people see that history of this place being a swimming pool. It was a private swimming pool. It was transformed into a public space. So we wanted to keep it as this, as it is. And when we were publishing it, uh, on the Instagram, and on the one hand, of course, we were questioning ourselves whether we did the right thing or not. I wanted to, I mean, this is ugly, actually. Um, ugly, looking at the photograph, it's ugly. And I wanted to write something about its ugliness. And uh, so I was reading uh, the articles of Ursula, and she wrote about uh, the sex theory for literature, actually. So she says, like, within the story, there's always competition, war, uh, you know, pushing and pulling, discussions, conflicts, and you don't really need to have this. Sometimes the, a story might not have any of these concepts, but still can be listened very carefully. So he, she talks about Elizabeth Fisher's uh, global theory. So she says, you know, in the cave walls, we see the people um, uh, hunting uh, mammals. And maybe first, they were not using those spears, but they were maybe using the sex. Uh, the sex that we uh, first used. And then the um, onset of the humanity's history can be completely different. So this is maybe the 10th presentation. I mean, I'm talking about this uh, presentation again. Uh, but um, so in the last, uh, always during the Q&A session, People always ask us, can you please talk about the relation of sack theory with architecture? But what I'm trying to say is, I mean, the more I talked about it, the more sense it started to make. And of course, the exhibition also helped us a lot because, you know, we're talking about a hero, an individual hero, both in the uh, theory of evolution, uh, uh, but when 
you adapt this to the architecture world, most of the time the architect is the hero or the building is the hero. But now it has changed. By the way, this is not anything that I'm making up. In the last decade, it changed around the world. I mean, there's this Fitzgar Award, a very famous architecture award. And when, I mean, 20 years ago, Herzog Demeron, the Swiss architect who took the award, they transformed the current um, building into a completely different building. Oh my God, suddenly it appeared here on the screen. So these transformation projects, for instance, this is a transformation project from that team as well. And uh, they actually call this the Aikido strategy. They take the energy from the other party and they use it to win over the other person, the enemy. The enemy is the current building, as you see, like an uh, artwork. This is a, a port place in Hamburg. And on top of it, they actually built a building for the Philharmonic Orchestra. And it's a very impressive building. but. From a strategic perspective, um, you know, they spent 10 times more than the, uh, the planned budget, and it took longer, much, much longer time than it was planned. Even the German parliament uh, started to discuss this project. And the most important thing here is like shining, shining like a um, knight in armor in the middle of the city. So. So this is what we were actually, I mean, look at this one, Lakatan and Vassal. This is another transformation project, the old version, the new version. And here it says, never demolish, always uh, transform. But then, with and for the inhabitants, it says. So do it together with the inhabitants and for the inhabitants. This is actually exact contrast of this strategy. And when you look at this um, city, probably you wouldn't really just look at it or you wouldn't definitely take a photo in front of it. But the story of it is very uh, interesting. People shoot documentaries about this because this building is transformed while the inhabitants actually live there. Most of the time, people demolish such buildings and then rebuild it again, and then the rent is so high, the people um, who used to live there has to move to a more peripheric uh, place in the city. But this building is transformed um, when um, the residents were actually living in the building. And when and the building is complete, the rent is slightly much higher because the cost of transformation is very low. So this is like a heroic um, story of this transformation. And here is a story that you have to understand. And, and so this is how the first spark came out. I mean, we when they first came and asked us to demolish the swimming pool, we did not want to do it, but of course, this is how we were taught in the university. When you demolish something, rebuild it again, then you will be the hero. But we really tried to convince them. We said, let's not demolish the swimming pool. Let's, let's keep it because it has a story, and now people will get together. In the past, people used to get together in the swimming pool too. So the building is not interesting, but the story is interesting. So this is actually, and it's not even beautiful, um, um, but the story is meaningful. So then everyone looks at it from a different angle. And, and that's how we have uh, transformed uh, the story. While this long transformation process has been an inspiration, and at the same time, the background, as you have mentioned, um, is was just a place where the mayors could only use, it turned into a public space with the um, changing administration of Istanbul. I think the codes are very important that you protect the tiles and the pool somewhat has been preserved. But um, in all the dialogues, while uh, the issue is that the space is still being um, mentioned as a pool. So your examples refer to transformation. And with that, I'd like to now proceed with your manifest. In the manifest, 
you mentioned that the deadline uh, well, should be reconciled. And there is another concept that I link to reconciliation. Uh, when the people lose reconciliation, when they fall into a dilemma whether to use that space again or not, the only thing that is left behind is the memory. In the urban memory, uh, they just basically uh, well, stand out as the places and the memories of the public. So I, I'm wondering about your opinions in that. So maybe we can also mention the manifest. Rather than the memory, using the word reconciliation is a preferred choice of word because memory seems to me somewhat subjective. Uh, obviously, we cannot talk about the memories of others, and it is very debatable what the collective memory means. So when we call it a reconciliation, then uh, we see that there is a common ground uh, not to demolish it. I think it's um, more of an appropriate term for a joint a common ground. That's what we thought. Uh, about this building, well, uh, this is the provincial uh, private administration building of Gaziantep. It's uh, f famous with its ugliness, and it was demolished uh, six months before the earthquake, and the demolishing process took really very long. It was a very um, sound structure since it was very um, difficult to demolish it. The 40 hectares of area around it was um, pronounced as a protection area, but rather than uh, dealing with the neighboring uh, structures, they started with this. Uh, when we went to Karimamraj because of the earthquake later on, the discussion was especially Gen Z. Uh, what they told us is this is Trabzon um, Street, one of the main streets of Karimamraj. Well, they said, yes, it was the ugly building, but it was the most interesting building. It was our meeting place. It was a symbolic uh, building uh, with its ugliness. Basically, we um, it was embedded in our memories for that generation. They said it turned into a symbol for us for our daily lives. But um, those who want this building to be demolished complain that it was destroyed, the silhouette, um, and the complaint of its postmodern architecture because it was a really, um, well, um, cumbersome building. And the Chamber of Architects fought a lot not to demolish it, but based on the memory. So they basically make a survey. They say 50% of the citizens say uh, that please demolish this. The remaining 50% said, no, it shouldn't be demolished. We show it to the tourists. So if you follow the memory, then it would really be too hard. But uh, while the saying that there's an economic value behind it, and if we transform it rather than demolishing it, uh, considering all the construction inconveniences that we cause and try to, uh, well, basically um, have the reconciliation. That's why uh, we called it reconciliation. Okay, now about the manifest and the collective side of this. This deserted structure uh, with the open call, a collective process for the exhibition already was planned. So what was your expectation here? And while well, DJ findings that would uh, that contributed to it to the unexpected manner because when I saw the examples of the accommodation, especially the these building blocks, deserted building blocks that are not being used anymore. From time to time we discussed this in Ankara as well as the person coming from Ankara. And we as well, the buildings that have been deserted, not being used uh, under the um, well ownership of the government, and then they're just demolished in one night and then we lose them. I think this open call uh, is a big part of this exhibition. So can you please elaborate on this? Uh, frankly to say, there are two layers here. The first one, as you mentioned, there are so many, too many projects. And the basic uh, idea was to talk about them in Venice. But at first, what we thought was there are so many buildings. Most probably will have a deal with a photographer uh, who will go to many corners of Turkey and uh, well shoot the photos and videos, and then we could exhibit the traditional method, right? But then, as Selin has mentioned, 
It's Sarkhan joining the team. What we discussed is while we're uh, talking about the transformation of the existing building, how important they are, but while well, these new photos, I mean, which the photographers would, uh, of course, would be careful taking them, these nice and fancy photos, and then we thought, wouldn't it basically, um, well, conflicting, because there are so many photos of these on internet, and there are so many YouTube videos, there are YouTubers, they go to these um, castles, for instance, I believe everyone knows this building there. This is a place where uh, many YouTubers go and document. Why should we go there and take another photo of them? Because there are already uh, millions of photos of these places, of these videos. So why don't we go ahead and use them? Why uh, shouldn't we make an open call and make it more comprehensive and also reach out to the spaces or places that we could have not reached otherwise. This being the case, our um, basically burden really lightened a lot, uh, a lot. The cost of the exhibition really was relieved to a greater extent because the basic purpose was to transform them. And secondly, even uh, we were able to reach out to larger messes even before the exhibition started because when you do something in Venice, it might be problematic. We know it from the previous PNLs. There is an exhibition far away and it is very, very difficult to travel from here there and uh, getting more difficult by the day because of the economic conditions. So what we're stuck with is, okay, we could ex have the exhibition there, but we should also have something here too. Open Call was one of them. So uh, there was no exhibition at all uh, first and this issue started to be discussed with an Instagram account in Turkey it started with that and then it was already started to be discussed in other um, well uh, platforms so it was very very um, positive well you said the job burden diminished but no that didn't happen at all because Asan said that would you like to spend all your energy on this and documenting this uh, structures and archive uh, make an archive of them as far as I'm concerned it's not what you want to do you don't want to draw this dark panorama and then stop because Asan said suggested that you should write a manifest that we had a manifest and we should write it so basically um, this we, uh, thanks to that, had the energy to, uh, well, save some space for the book of all these photographs. And also, um, well, these uh, art of form, big structures that a photographer should photograph. No, they're not like that. We're not, the, this is not what we'd like to document. We only uh, emphasize, we only want to document it. The photographers also became a part of the call, but there were some other very impressive photos uh, sent by non-photographers. Yes, this is a, a huge um, opportunity. I mean, feeling a part of Turkish pavilion, uh, you also uh, feel this, the art participants, just like detectives, um, go to an idle space, they photograph them, and they make some, this effort to be a part of this exhibition. So this collective process also uh, here is very, very important. What I wonder is, I mean, the mm, exhibition, um, well, mm, puts this forward very nicely, but in time, how about the situation, current situation of these structures, the documenting of these and also researching them, it creates a huge discussion about that. So to link it to today, the point of view that has been created with this exhibition, do you think that it also gives opportunity to um, reinstate the function of these buildings or what you're trying to say is that this reinstating um, while well, through reconciliation is not about them fighting themselves again. No, we just want to basically um, put these stories on the forefront. And this is the story. No, on the contrary, just like what you said at the beginning, in one of the um, booths, by the way, in the exhibition, there's a metropolitan building of Marsin. Um, well, Cengiz Bektaş, 52-story, uh, back then one of the highest um, um, buildings of uh, Turkey, and a big part was deserted. Right when we were doing this, Mersin municipality transformed three or four stories of the building and carried some municipal uh, units to there. And see, this is 
this is how it was. This was last year, October. By the way, um, part of the structures, we went there. We went, we already went there before the BNL. And for instance, when we uh, went to Anka Park, well, that Anka Park, really, I mean, if you're from Ankara and you haven't gone, been to Anka Park yet, please go there, it's shocking. I mean, well, basically, it really it changes your perspective to city, to resources, to policy. It's very weird, a surreal, surreal place. So we exhibited this um, at the BNL because what we always thought was, well, yes, you know, these are intimidating. You know, transforming this building is very difficult, very expensive. No, it's not like that. It's all a matter of approach. And when it comes to local authorities, it's like, oh, Madison Municipality did it, so we should do it too. So it worked, and we should do it too. So the local authorities, they think they shouldn't feel alone because everyone has this burden. When we were making the research at the beginning of applying the BNR, so we say Chorum deserted building, Adana deserted building, every time something comes up, never empty. So um, it's not very difficult to reach out to these structures because they're covered by the local newspapers to a large extent. So we paid great importance that these examples are actually encouraging um, by the way, municipality moved to this building, four or five stories of building, and we were able to put that photo in the exhibition as well, both the deserted version and also when the municipality moved to the building. We were able to uh, showcase it as a good example of transformation. So the purpose here, for instance, we had a lot of, um, we were also discussing this with Ika Seve, well, um, you're an architect, they said, you should make it, maybe draw a project for a couple of them. Of course, I mean, um, while drawing the good examples of this transformation, so on and so forth, that was not the purpose. It's all about talking about a strategy that we have resources at hand to transform them. Otherwise, I mean, you can tell the end, but um, well, the other method is open-ended. I mean, anyone basically uh, are able to see the tools, the instruments to transform it. That was the purpose. Our purpose was not doing something didactic. And uh, the purpose of using AI is we just want to showcase that even AI, when you write a couple codes, can come up with a scenario. So it's not just that difficult. But if you just say upfront, oh, it's ugly, then the end of the story ends like the one in Kahraman Maraj. I mean, if you say this is the silliest building in the world and you do nothing, then there is nothing to do at all, right? Um, OK, so Madison's Belediye municipality moving to a couple stories of this building is a nice example. Uh, I wonder whether there have been any uh, local authorities reaching out to us and asking your opinion about how to use that uh, building, anyone who contacted you. Normally, nobody really uh, calls us from Turkey. We got calls from out abroad. No, I said we applied to the BNL for a couple of times. It was in 2018. Our application was about um, the um, post-disaster floating survival unit uh, for the possible earthquake in Istanbul after that. Uh, it will be a um, design uh, BNL, and uh, well, Ikaseve showed it to a curator, and they really liked it, and they said we should showcase it in design. So we developed this project, and we did it. There was also the training part of it, um, architecture, faculty, sociology department, construction department, Boğaziçi University, MEF University. We built a studio, while uh, 40 uh, students and also um, instructors it was a um, did a well um, a good process for us we also um, produced the prototype of it in the office and from the Esquire a journal in Taiwan to the disaster office of Taiwan, but nobody really called from Turkey. It was not even published in the initial two years. Then, after Marash earthquake, they just happened to remember that there was this 
project, uh, so the um, architecture platforms and others, while called us. And there was this decoration journal who called us, and we were like, it was March. We thought, I mean, uh, it, it attached the, in, attracted the interest of so many people. Even a decoration journal will be showing a building post um, while earthquake. And then we were discussing it. Well, you could decorate this, decorate that. So we sent the uh, uh, photos, and by the way, we uh, forgot later on whether the, the journal was pu published, broadcast or not. And then we asked them to send a PDF to us when we remembered. And the, the texts were the texts that we sent, uh, Istanbul's uh, post-earthquake scenario, what it's going to do. And the uh, by the way, there was a huge space that was uh, allocated. And I believe the visuals may be from this Netherlands. There is a floating house. The curtains are flying. There is a nice lady looking from the door. And just after the earthquake, when we all was feeling blue, I felt like this uh, anger, rush of anger. And uh, how could this happen? I sent a, a, an email to the editor, and I said, how could you do this? Are you aware what you're doing this? And then they called us and said, well, sorry, we just want to do a good faith a social responsibility for the earthquake. I see that that's what happened to us. You're scolding us. I said, no, you shouldn't think about social responsibility or anything. Anyway, they changed it later in the digital version. But if you had this magazine in your, uh, in your houses, that was such a... Um, well, lack of awareness. Maybe it seemed ugly to them because it's a decoration journal. You know, um, it, you know, you're sharing this entire drive file, and there's the text. And I thought I sent the wrong pictures. Well, I asked her whether she sent other photos. That's what we thought. Well, we wondered whether they didn't like our project and they just wanted to come up with another house that would go well with their decoration. Why we are um, while well, telling you about this is, unfortunately, our approach towards this in Turkey just is based on certain reflexes, and there are so many biases. And we're not like, oh, this is the municipality, they will get it. No. I mean, we go to so many places, try to talk about our projects, so we're very eager to share. And we don't think that this project is uh, too much for Turkey. Uh, well, I just said that, for instance, what bring us to Turkey and said it's too much for Turkey. We don't think about that. And I, I basically feel old. I mean, uh, I just think that everyone should see it. I hope that it, oh, I wish that it was in Ankara. Yeah, yes. In, and so many people from local authorities in Marmara Urban Forum. I specifically ask you, I mean, um, when there's this exhibition project that has been processed so well, I hope, um, well, you would hear our call. So how the um, building stocks are structured, talk about that. We talked about the open call and talked about the manifest, but there is the building process of the exhibition in Venice. You mentioned, I mean, the square meters and the well, materials being abundant during the construction. So we're also wondering about that. Well, that part was full of unknowns. Um, at the design phase, after the open call, we uh, thought about so many uh, well, examples, and we're an experienced uh, studio. We did so many installations. We did it in London, Rotterdam, Istanbul. We thought that we knew the materials, so we thought we shouldn't take a risk. It's a, already a difficult job. In, in. And also, while it might be otherwise impressive, a very simple idea. We're going to just hang this on the wall, and there will be a long table. This is the simplest and the most easy to apply thing in the world, and we don't want to conflict with what we did. I mean, just uh, putting a very chic architect uh, thing. Uh, and um, there was another reason why we use textile to that feeling of temp, uh, temp, um, per impermanence. And also, uh, well, it's a good example. I mean, the Vienna was a good example, turning into a 
for instance, shipyard. Well, we want to build a relationship with what is existing, we just didn't want to put it uh, there as space shuttle. So rather than building a new structure, we thought we should simply hang these textiles in the wall. And the um, table is like, I mean, just with two um, legs. And there was a direct print on the wood and try to reduce the craftsmanship because it's very expensive in Venice. It's the exact opposite of Turkey. Because of some practical reasons, um, well, we came up this, with this idea. And of course, it was very challenging because we went to do a prototype, uh, first of all, in January. For instance, we did a similar project in 2013 in Istanbul. So in installation projects, we always, first of all, establish a prototype and try it out. So we went to try it out. We said it's a very... Um, simple idea anyway, but then the columns were not straight and um, the walls were not straight. I mean, imagine it's such a thin rectangle, um, but it's not a rectangle. There is like a, um, a different angle here in the parallels. Like if you draw a straight line here, uh, do you think you would arrive to this window? But no, if you draw a straight line, you go to another uh, window. So we uh, have to actually hang three fabrics here. But it's such a simple idea. Why is it not happening? Why? And the columns uh, are, as I said, has a certain angle. And uh, it's a diagonal um, line suddenly. And and the and the walls are also crooked, uh, but it looks like a perfect rectangle from a distance. But unfortunately, it's not even not the beams are straight. So this uh, we said how we can make it seem like it is straight. Um, and so there were the uh, cuffs. We put here and we uh, st uh, tried to do, uh, I mean, first of all, it was like we were hanging laundry. I mean, it really looked very crooked, very weird. And just imagine a little angle and the curtains are, had 10 centimeters between them. But when the angle is not straight, then uh, all of them get in one into another but the ap application uh, team was amazing the installation team was amazing they did it really uh, very meticulously so for 30 meters long um, all the distances were exactly 10 centimeters but of course um, so when you do something from scratch, it's amazing. For instance, it would be a, a perfect installation in this room, in this very room. But then, uh, I mean, we did, um, in, in the book, there's a part called um, in-place investigation. Uh, this is something that the architects always avoid in, in Turkey. But there can be sometimes very unknown um, things like it's just like the swimming pool example. They would demolish that swimming pool and they would in three days build a completely new building in place of the swimming pool. But when you do not do that like that, when you try to change something that is already existing, is much more challenging. That's why you need to reconcile. Um, you need to have a dialogue with this space. You need to speak to it, and then you need to redesign it. You need uh, to also sometimes withdraw some of your opinions as an architect, because otherwise it could be like, we can do our own beams here uh, on top of it, completely straight beams, and it could have been much easier. But of course, there would be some extra cost. Uh, and then it would look a little bit weird. I mean, there are already uh, existing beams, and that would be a waste, an unnecessary waste. So this project really challenged ourselves as well. I mean, you're calling it a sack theory. And then if it's a sack, let it fit into the sack. So that was an interesting experience all in all. And such challenge always exists if you're really dealing with something um, that is uh, existing. 
uh, so uh, what about the international media I mean you found uh, I mean, you, you were very much mentioned in the international press and were you satisfied uh, with the project? What about the interactions in the biennial? How were people's reactions to your project? I mean, there were so many materials, and um, they always said um, in, in the Turkish pavilion, people always spent maximum or the average of three minutes. So we always thought we were working for three minutes. There's so many different countries, especially in the Jardinier, because there's Jardinier and Arsenal, and in Jardinier there's England, uh, France, etc. such countries. Arsenal is the place where we are, but we, we were in the main exhibition area, by the way. So we were always uh, having this feeling of we're working only for three minutes. But then there are so many materials on the desks. Like you have to spend days if you really want to understand the theme. Who is going to read these things? Why are you making me write all this thing when there's no one uh, that will actually be reading it? But then again, I was looking for um, ghost stories, and there was a video in Portuguese and English. And there was this Zoom presentation, and the 20th minute of the uh, presentation movie sorry you see our book and there was a desk where we have actually transformed uh, the desk and so the man doing the presentation got the book read it in detail and then I sent the presentation to my sister who's living in Brazil and who speaks Portuguese. And he, what, what does he say? And, and so a professor uh, from Brazil uh, really found it very cool. And then I thought, oh my God, really? I mean, I was so sure that no one would ever read anything that we have written. Imagine 15 tables. I was thinking, who would read it? So now I realize when you're creating something, don't really overthink. Someone's going to read it. Someone, I mean, it's just like a letter sent to the space. Don't ever think about it. Someone someday will read it, and it's going to touch someone one day. I mean, Orhan always believed that everyone would read, by the way. Uh, I mean, by the way, always it was a bestseller. I mean, I always dreamed about writing a bestseller about architecture, and I never thought that this would be that book. If you have the book with you, by the way, uh, we can sign it. I mean, first I wrote the book in English, and then I said I'm going to translate it into Turkish. So I translated it into Turkish, and sometimes the English and Turkish versions don't match one another. But I never thought that it would become a bestseller in English, so I'm very much proud of it. Okay, we have very limited uh, time. Uh, my last question, and then I'm going to turn to the audience for their questions. Well, my personal opinion is that all this selection, I mean, combined with this idea and combined with the design, is an amazing potential. And this potential also turns into an emotion, maybe like hope. Maybe this is not the best definition, but uh, these um, structural uh, stocks, they turn into life. And I was very much impressed and excited about this. I didn't go to Venice yet. Hopefully, I'll have the chance to see it before it closes down. But all this exhibition, all this work, I mean, does it still defend the first thought that you came up with? I mean, um, do you really think that this selection really gives this hope or another emotion that you are uh, looking for to the audience? I mean, this feeling of being abandoned, um, the gray, I mean, within the gray, there is a colorful life, like a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And just when such a big disaster in our country was over, by the way, 
uh, the building stocks that were not damaged by the earthquake are now abandoned anyway. So this actually shows the relationship between the buildings that were constructed back in the time uh, in Turkey. So from that point on, do you really think that your exhibition still defends your first thoughts? Well, as I first said, um, the laboratory of future concept, uh, in, it says, in, in that it says hope is a very powerful currency. And that was a very important statement for us. Not only in this, I mean, we had another project called, for instance, Hop on Water. That was a house um, floating on the sea. And this is what we always try to do. I mean, in our daily lives, Turkish people always complain about everything. They complain about the things going ba bad, downwards, negative, etc. So all in these research uh, projects, we wanted to to um, prioritize hope, or else it would be much easier to draw a very dark portrait, and then it would be like, OK, let's talk about this now to the world. But no, we wanted to see this as a potential. Because, you know, we're in economic trouble, um, and the economic crisis is all over the world, and the natural resources are depleting. I mean, there's so much to complain around the world anyway. But that was the reason why we actually built that table. Don't complain. There is a resource. There are raw materials. And how can we turn these raw materials, these resources, into buildings? How can we turn these into good stories? And in fact, after a couple of BNLs, we were thinking like we could transform them for the second time. And then we tell the story of the second transformation as a country. So. Uh, that is what we wished for, actually. So we are optimistic because of that. I mean, otherwise, we have two kids. I mean, we have to leave everything and go. Uh, but this building in Kahraman Maraj, for instance, when we first applied with this idea uh, that existed in, in, in our first project, and we wanted to do two panels. We wanted to spread this discussion throughout Turkey, actually. We thought that we would hold two panels, one in Kahraman Maraj, one in Maris, uh, Ankara. I mean, Ankara in the last 20 years has so many abandoned building stocks. So then came the um, earthquake, and we could only do the conference in Ankara, not Maraş in Madison. But at that point, I mean, uh, when we were doing the Istanbul earthquake project, I mean, in media, you know, Istanbul earthquake is always shown as the last thing. It's like the doomsday, and there will be nothing beyond that. So people don't really want to get prepared because they, that's how it's launched. Uh, and we've seen the same thing in Maraş earthquake. I mean, post earthquake. Uh, process is as important as the preparation to the earthquake. And there were three tables that we have um, envisaged. One of them was about concrete. One of them is about CSI uh, investigation uh, of the case. And the third desk was about the repair shop. So we actually, it, when we were talking about these things before the earthquake, we were thinking like no one's going to really pay attention to it here. They were going to say, why are we looking at concrete? Only the architectural nerds will be interested in this. But then when, um, when there was uh, the earthquake, everyone started talking about the different types of concrete. And you actually see it in Maraş, for instance, um, um, the, um, you see the, um, the, the concrete that has fallen down from the uh, buildings, and they're like uh, the aggregates are eight, nine centimeters. And everyone was asking the question of like, how such a country that is so expert in construction can construct such lousy buildings. I mean, so such a country can actually transform these buildings and maybe can enter the life of architecture, world of architecture, with these transformation stories. So we call this immobilization. Maybe there can be such immobilization. Thank you so much. 
And now I have an additional uh, time. The interpreters have to go to other sessions. So um, you can actually ask your questions once the session is over. So let's uh, finish it off with hope. Thank you very much. It was a great um